Now, if it seems like I'm being a little repetitive, think about why. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe it's because this is really important. Remember, everything in PowerShell is an object. Objects have properties which, which describe how they work. And they can have methods which make them take some kind of action. Services, processes, files, folders, all of these things are objects inside of Windows PowerShell. And that's what you're going to work with. Now, I've already talked about the get member commandlet. If you pipe an object to get member, or GM, by the way, that's its alias, it tells you about the object. It tells you what type it is, uh, what kind of object, if it's a service or a file or whatever else. It tells you what properties it have, and it tells you what methods it has. Get member teaches you about objects so that you don't have to constantly turn to the documentation, look stuff up. It's all right there to be discovered in PowerShell, which brings us to variables. PowerShell uses variables as temporary named storage for objects. Variable names begin with a dollar sign, and variable names can contain, for the most part, letters, numbers, and the underscore character. How long can variable names be? Long enough, seriously. There's a limit, but it's huge, and it's not something you need to uh, strive for. Use sensible, easy-to-understand variable names, and you'll be fine. You can declare variables in advance. A lot of folks accustomed to VBScript or other programming languages ask this. You can use the new variable commandlet to do it, although it's not necessary to declare them, and in fact, there's no way to make it a requirement as you can in most programming languages. PowerShell is a strongly typed language, meaning it recognizes different data types. Something that's kind of interesting about variables is that they're not things in and of themselves. They're really just names for a place in your computer's memory where an object is stored. So a variable doesn't have its own properties or methods. It just exposes the properties and methods of whatever object it contains or, or that it refers to. And you can prove that by putting some objects into a variable and then piping them to get member. And you'll actually see the methods and properties of the object itself. Uh, you know, I, I could talk about it forever. It's probably easier just to show you. Here, I'm assigning the string hello to a variable named var. I can then pipe that to get member to see what properties and methods, well, one property, but lots of methods in this case, that the object has. Get member shows me that this is a string object, too. Notice that one of the methods shown is to upper, which I'm guessing creates an uppercase version of the string. Let's try it out. Dollar sign $var dot to upper, open and close parentheses. Notice that the parentheses are required. Normally, they'd contain any input arguments that the method needed. In this case, there aren't any input arguments, but you still have to include the empty parentheses. The result is an uppercase hello. But if I look at what's in dollar sign $var, I see that it hasn't changed. So the to upper method produced a new string rather than modifying the existing one. I can work with the property in a similar way. Dollar sign $var dot length shows me the length of my string object. Now let's try a number. I'll put 5 into var. If I pipe that to gm, I see that it's now recognized as an integer, or int32 more specifically. So what happens if I try to run its to upper method? I get an error, because int32 objects don't have a to upper method. So the to upper method wasn't part of the variable var. Rather, it was part of the object contained within the variable. Once that object was of a different type, to upper was no longer available. PowerShell tries to figure out what type of data you're working with in a variable, and it does that every single time you use it. So this allows uh, a character like 5 to be treated as a number, 5, or to be treated as a text string, the character 5. And unfortunately, sometimes PowerShell can get a little bit confused about how it's supposed to be treating a variable. So let's start by talking about the common variable types. Now this is not an exhaustive list, but they're the ones you're going to work with, I think, the most. String, int is for an integer or a whole number. Boolean is true and false values. Uh, a reg x is a regular expression, and we talk about those in the intermediate course. Single and double are single and double precision floating numbers. You have array, and again, there are many more. Those are the ones you're going to work with the most. So let's, see and, let's look and see how these variable types really come into play and how PowerShell works with them. Let's start by using read host to have the user enter a number and store that number in a variable. So, what type of data do you think we're working with? A string? A number? Well, unfortunately, we can't tell what the user entered. If they enter a name, 
other than the number as we asked, we're definitely not working with a number. Here's what the user entered, stored in our variable, and here's what shows up when it's piped to get member. There's a nice way to force this to be a number though. I'll specify a specific variable type, int, in square brackets before the variable name. This locks the variable so that it can only store integers from here on out. If the user enters a string, an error is displayed because that can't be stored in the variable anymore. If the user enters a number, we can see that in the variable and then pipe it to get member to see if it is in fact int32. If I try to manually put a string into that variable, I get an error as predicted. In Windows PowerShell, an array is a special type of variable that's capable of holding multiple objects, not just one. Usually those objects are all of the same type, but not necessarily. Each object in the array has an index number, which is how you refer to that particular object from within the array. Now, zero is the first item in the array. One is the second item, and so forth. Negative one is the last item. Negative two is the next to the last item, and so on. Any commandlet that returns a collection of objects, like getProcess, returns an array of sorts. You can create your own arrays too. Really, any comma-separated list of values is treated as an array by PowerShell, although the at sign is a specific array operator, as shown in this example. You can pipe arrays to commandlets, just like you can pipe any collection of objects to a commandlet. You can also access individual elements in the array by using the array's variable name, and in square brackets, the index number of the element you're after. And here's a tip. Arrays and collections aren't technically the same thing, but for most practical purposes in Windows PowerShell, you can think of them as the same thing. A collection of objects is the same as an array of objects. And look, if you have software developers in your companies, don't tell them I said that because they'll freak out because, I mean, at a certain level, collections and arrays are different, but we're just admins. We're just here trying to get a job done and arrays and collections count as the same thing for our purposes. I'll create a new array containing three string objects. Notice that the comma delimited list is what forces this to be turned into an array. If I look at the array, I can see that all three elements are in there. I can access just the first element of the array by including its index, zero, in square brackets. I can use that same syntax to access the first element's methods and properties, such as here, where I use the first element's to upper method. Let's look at a second example. I'll use getWMIObject to retrieve all of the Win32 service instances on my computer. That collection of objects is a kind of array, too, and when I store it in the variable WMI, it can be used well, pretty much like an array. For example, I'll access the second element's name property by using that variable. I can also pipe the array to format table to create custom formats. For most purposes within PowerShell, the terms array and collection of objects are completely interchangeable. The backtick is the universal escape character in PowerShell. On US keyboards, this is usually in the upper left corner of your keyboard on the same key as the tilde character. At the end of a line, it escapes the carriage return and so acts as a line continuation character. Before a space, the backtick escapes the space, making it a literal character rather than a parameter separator. Special escape sequences include backtick A, which rings the system bell, backtick n, which generates a new line character, and so forth. Here's a quick look at uses for PowerShell's escape character. You've seen before that this syntax won't work because PowerShell interprets the space between program and files as a delimiter. One solution we've used is to enclose the path in quotation marks, and that works fine. However, you can also escape just the space by preceding it with a backtick. This tells PowerShell that the space is not a delimiter, but rather just a space, and the command now works. Other escape sequences have special meaning. Backtick A produces an alert or beep, while backtick N produces a new line character. Please pause this video now and follow the instructions in your lab guide to complete this lab. There are hints in the lab guide if you need them, and try to complete the lab without referring to the solution in your lab guide. When you're done, Resume this video and I'll review a sample solution with you. Let's review lab 12-1. For task one, I simply piped a string directly to get member to see its properties and methods. For task two, I specifically typed a variable as a string and then assigned a number to it. Even though the five is not in quotes, 
dollar sign var will be a string because I told PowerShell to make it a string. For task three, I'm putting a string into var. Then I'm executing the starts with method to see if the string starts with an X. It doesn't, so the method returns a value of false. In task four, I start by creating an array of three elements. I then pipe that array to where object, filtering out those objects which do not have a length less than four. The remaining objects are piped to write host and given a four color of green. The result is a list of two objects, since one of my input objects has a length that doesn't meet my criteria. Finally, for task five, I put a string into a variable. Then, in a second variable, I put a string which contains the first string. The new string is contained in double quotation marks, which is significant. Inside double quotation marks, PowerShell looks for dollar signs, which start variable names. It replaces variables with their content, so that when I look at what's inside var2, I can see that var was replaced with its contents.